be. Um, as Dr. Lawrence so kindly said, my name is Nicholas Hayes Mota. I'm the assistant director of the Clow Center. And uh, in my research as a social ethicist and a public theologian, I focus broadly on fundamental normative questions of democracy, in particular on the possibility of a politics of the common good in contemporary pluralistic societies, and on the various roles played by religion for good and ill in democratic public life. And so it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the fourth panel of our symposium, which focuses on the place of digital space. Now, in the early years of its existence, the cyberspace created by the internet was often envisioned idealistically as a sphere of greater freedom and liberation. Digital space, its advocates and boosters hoped, would facilitate the rapid dissemination of information, enhance democratic participation, and potentially transcend the physical, cultural, and political borders that divide us. Now, in some ways, one could argue, these hopes have proved true in recent years, however, we've seen that digital space can just as well be an arena rife with lies, conspiracies, and misinformation, that it can strengthen rather than bridge social divisions, and that it can become a powerful tool not only for liberatory social movements, as it has been, but also for autocratic governments and extremist groups. And as a result, many analysts now count the darker side of digital space as one of the gravest threats to democratic societies. For the purposes of this symposium, moreover, digital space raises some very interesting questions about the nature of place today, as well as the changing landscape of our political and cultural geography. Most fundamentally, is digital space fruitfully thought of as a place at all? How is it similar to or different from more traditional and materially embodied kinds of place? And how should the relationship between these two dimensions of our social reality, increasingly intertwined as they are, be understood? Secondly, how has the rise of digital space challenged, reinforced, or transformed the nation state system? Is it a threat to state sovereignty, a mechanism for expanding it, or both? Third, how does digital space interact with other modes of organizing place, from the neighborhood to the transnational network to the geography of the sacred about which we learned so richly this morning? What challenges and opportunities does it present to these alternative logics of place and it's meant to place? With these questions in mind, let me now introduce the two panelists who will be exploring them in conversation with each other and with you. Professor Fabio Benincasa is an adjunct professor for Duquesne University Rome campus and Università Nicola Cusano in Italy. An independent critic and occasional curator, he is the author of several essays on cinema and has collaborated with the Museum of Contemporary Art in Rome. He is also editor of Frontiere della Psicoanalisi. Digital media is one of Professor Benincasa's principal interests. In 2014, after the first year of Pope Francis's papacy, he authored The Social Pope, in the magazine Formique to comment on the role of social media within it. With Andrea Polegato, he is the editor of Machiavelli and Contemporary Media. And currently, Professor Benincasa is teaching a class on aesthetics and sociology of new media for the Nova Academia Bella Arte in Rome. Joining him today is Anina Schwarzenbach, a sociologist and postdoctoral fellow at the Institute for Criminal Law and Criminology in the University of Bern. Her work lies at the intersection of sociology, criminology, and computational social sciences, focusing on social threats and governmental responses, social networks, media narratives, polarization, and state legitimacy. She has also worked extensively on issues related to institutional discrimination, policing of minorities, and other forms of social injustice. In her current project, in collaboration with the Klaus Center for the Study of Constitutional Democracy here and with me, Dr. Schwarzenbach analyzes the media discourse on violent extremism and its consequences for public opinion. Previously, she was a fellow with the Harvard Kennedy School's Cyber Project, a Belfer Center international security program, as well as a member of the Belfer team that built the National Cyber Power Index in 2020. For her research, she was awarded a Swiss National Science Foundation Postdoc Mobility Grant and a Fondazione Leonardo Research Grant. 
I'm sure both of our panelists will have many insights to share with you in the minutes to come. So please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Fabio Benincasa. Okay, now you can hear me. Okay, I want to thank, uh, thank the Cloud Center for having me here in uh, this interesting uh, uh, conference. And uh, I will try to, I tend to divagation, so uh, just uh, to summarize what I want to say is uh, that uh, on one side, uh, we have a tendency to recreate uh, the territorial space uh, uh, in a mental space, and this is a modern uh, tendency. When I say modern, uh, modern uh, in the sense uh, uh, that we intend uh, in, uh, uh, in the scholarly studies, so from the Renaissance up, before maybe it was, uh, was uh, different, but I don't know, I'm not, uh, I'm not an expert. And uh, uh, this tendency is uh, transforming uh, uh, eventually in uh, uh, a sort of mirroring the territorial space, especially in touch with uh, first the construction of the, of the national state and then uh, eventually with the, the opening of uh, uh, the internet, cyber, the so-called cyberspace. Now I'll, uh, I'll read you, but I don't, don't read you really, a, a, a poem, a stanza of a very long poem, which I asked Nicholas to read, so you don't have to think to House of Gucci when I, when I talk, but uh, <laughs> to the British, uh, the British world. This is Edmund Spencer, Ruins of Rome, is 1591, the moment, uh, the moment in which we started to think uh, modernly and also to think to the modern state. Thou stranger, which for Rome and Rome here seekest, and not of Rome and Rome perceivest at all, these same old walls, old arches which thou seest, old palaces, is that which Rome men call. Behold what reek, what ruin, and what waste, and how that she which with her mighty power tamed all the world hath tamed herself at last, the prey of time which all things doth devour. Rome now of Rome is only funeral, and only Rome of Rome hath victory. Nay, aught save Tiber hastening to his fall remains of all. O world's inconstancy, that which is firm doth flit and fall away, and that is flitting doth abide and stay. So this uh, uh, just to demonstrate something, that Rome really uh, is a place in which you can uh, think uh, uh, as an interesting and distinct character and, uh, and identity is uh, uh, the eternal city uh, par excellence. But really, Rome is not Rome. Since uh, the, the time in which we started to visit uh, the ruins of Rome, with the idea they are ru ruins and not rubble, uh, rubbish inherited by a uh, past era, like in the Middle, in the middle Ages, uh, we have the idea that there, is, should, there should be another Rome somewhere else, or there should be a, a better Rome. This Rome automatically became a mental Rome to rebuild. A Renaissance uh, and a Baroque age in Rome, if you recently uh, took a tour in Rome, uh, was a, a great effort in rebuilding uh, uh, this city. There never was, uh, by the way, because of course it uh, was built on the example of, of the uh, Civitas Dei, of the divine city, not the city of the Roman Empire, which uh, is, a, uh, is a great passion for archaeologists, but is not uh, existing anymore. They try uh, sometimes to rebuild it, but it doesn't exist anymore. So the tendency is to think that the territory, even especially when it has uh, a very strong uh, uh, identity, it's really uh, a mental space, it's a recreation uh, of uh, something mental that was in the past. A part in particular, the idea of modernity starts with, we, think, uh, we start to think that there is a difference between uh, the past, uh, uh, the present, uh, and uh, especially the future. Now, now for us, uh, is a normal idea, but uh, during the Middle, Mi the Middle Ages was not uh, really an, mm, a current idea. Tradition uh, and the fact that uh, uh, 
what was rooted in the present uh, was constant and continuous, uh, a mirror of uh, the presence of God in, uh, uh, on, in the territory was uh, self-evident, at least uh, or, uh, what we can read in the, in the Western literature. I'm not an expert of, uh, uh, of the Asian uh, literature, but I can imagine to find uh, similar things. With the modernity, there is a, a sudden crack, and uh, there is the production of this uh, mental space, the space of uh, utopia, the non-place, the non-lieu in, uh, uh, in this case, but uh, a non-lieu which became sometimes more important than a territorial space. We talked about the Vatican, so it's uh, the production of public space, or what we define public space, in a way is uh, uh, an idea, also a modern, uh, a modern idea. That this is, there is a difference between uh, your private space and the public space. For instance, uh, this is the uh, map of, mm, again, we are in Rome, uh, uh, Giovanni Battista Nolli did uh, uh, the last big map of Rome uh, before Rome became uh, the capital of Italy uh, some century after. Uh, uh, this map. So uh, most of, uh, uh, of the ancient city, of the Renaissance city, was already there, and the Baroque city. And uh, uh, as you can, uh, many, important, uh, many important engravers participated in the production of this map. This map is, uh, is uh, famous in uh, urban planning of Rome, uh, including Giovanni Battista Piranesi. But anyway, what, what you can observe in this map is that the public space, uh, the street, uh, is matched by the public space of the church. So all, this is the Pantheon, you see this uh, character, the, the rotunda uh, of the Pantheon, but also, for instance, uh, uh, the St. Ignace Church here, uh, it's uh, considered uh, uh, a public space. So in, the, in this case, uh, uh, the notion of public space was really connected to the mapping, and who sponsored this mapping? Of course, uh, uh, the papacy. Uh, was uh, the main sponsor of, of this kind uh, uh, of mapping. For this reason, also, churches are, uh, are considered uh, open space. But in general, the opening, uh, the, mm, the working on open spaces uh, was uh, connected to the idea of controlling uh, the activity, uh, the everyday activity of people. Now, in Paris, for instance, we had the first, uh, after, uh, mm, in the, during the Baroque age, we have the opening of spaces such as uh, Plus, uh, plus the Vosges, uh, sponsored by the King of France. So it's, uh, uh, this topography apparently is exactly the contrary of this mental Rome uh, that still is, uh, anyway, digging and producing, uh, producing effects. Uh, in, uh, uh, it's, it's not a world of utopia, it's a world uh, in which we want to express and control the space. Now, In, instead, this is the uh, Vatican, uh, Vatican City. Oh, five minutes left. This is Vatican City. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, anyway, very interesting because uh, it's uh, a concrete, instead a concretization of, uh, uh, of the idea of state after 60 years in which uh, the Holy See was uh, deprived uh, of a state. Uh, you see, I cannot, I have not time to talk about the controversy about uh, this space uh, between the columns of, uh, uh, of Bernini, which uh, was undecided if it was uh, an Italian space or a Vatican space. But in, in Rome, there are anyway uh, other places, uh, other entities uh, which have a strange characteristic, like the sovereign military order of Malta. The sovereign or mi military order of Malta was dominating Malta before Malta was taken by the Ottoman Empire preserved the, the sovereignty, they still, they still have stamps, passports, they have everything except the territory. So this is a, they don't have a territory, but they have uh, parking space, uh, plates, uh, car plates, everything that you can decide in Rome. So this uh, also can be another example of, uh, uh, of our mental space. In, uh, uh, at a certain point, I skip all this stuff, the nomadic space uh, the idea of the nomadic space opposing the national states and, uh, and the construction of nomadic space became a stable of the uh, post-structuralist thinking. Deleuze et Guattari et Azon Plateau, for instance, is a, 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 typical, a typical example. The nomadic movement against uh, uh, the stratification and the constriction of, uh, of, the national, of the national state and the discovery or the invention, the recreation 
of the uh, internet, of the web space, became automatically a utopy for, uh, uh, mm, uh, in the next uh, 20 years, especially starting from the 80s, no? of, especially in science fiction. I mean, 1984 is a new romancer by William Gibson. But, for instance, uh, Manuel Castells uh, think about uh, the construction of a public mind, which interrelates with uh, the idea of uh, a public of a, the possibility of free public communication. So the, this mental public state suddenly is uh, embodied, concretized in the digital into the digital space. Of course, this was an utopy because uh, in the moment in which uh, uh, the platforms emerged in the last 20, 25 years, uh, we pass uh, in uh, a moment, I skip all this stuff, we can talk about it, talk, in a world of world gardens, uh, we are not talking about ma the mariology of the Hortus Conclusus, but a, a series of platforms uh, such as uh, Meta or Google that really want to keep us over there. This is not more a public space, it's a space that tries to extract everything that came from us, uh, from metadata, to directly money and uh, uh, not uh, keeping them inside. Those are not nations, but for me are the new nations, really, that are without being uh, really nations, because they are not connected to people. And the old uh, candid idea that automatically the digital space was giving great democratic possibility is reversing instead in a sort of uh, opaque hell of uh, control, uh, which uh, the, state are, uh, the state are suffering already and will suffer even more from the control uh, uh, of uh, this kind of platform. Because the possibility, for instance, for the Pope or for the President of the United States to have uh, an account on one of those platforms is also the possibility to have this uh, account shot by an internal authority, which is in that moment more powerful than the President of the United States, for instance. I think it happened in the, in, in the past, maybe it can happen also in the future. And this, for me, it's uh, uh, really uh, the interesting part. The part uh, related to the Church maybe can be discussed with the public. I don't want to exaggerate in my divagation and with Anna, of course. Thank you. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, mm -hmm. I guess. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lawrence and the Klaus Center for inviting me. Uh, and it's also a real pleasure to be on this panel together with Fabio. And I think like, it will not really be a response to what it's presented, but more like another point of view. Uh, and I want to address two specific questions in the following minutes. First of all, uh, if and how the digital space changed state power structures, so a really macro level question, and then bring you on this journey to dive into the micro level and look at how um, digital space changed human relationships. And I also want to kind of make two points that are maybe kind of a bit in, that would be a bit in response to what was just presented in a sense that nation states still matter in the digital space and so do uh, relationships and, and trusted relationships and local interactions. So first, let's start with the state power structure uh, and this is work I've carried out together with colleagues and many practitioners uh, uh, at the Harvard Cyber Project. So let's start by thinking about cyber and I think agreeing upon the fact that cyber has become a really key domain where power is contested uh, next to other well-known domains such as land uh, and space. And I think kind of a natural extension of that is also that we, the, that we want to ask what makes one state more powerful than others in cyberspace. And that we also want to think uh, about this question by using traditional conceptualization of, si of, of power, of national power. Uh, and there are a few of those, uh, but, uh, and I, I don't want to go into the details here, but I just think that by thinking about, uh, in, in terms maybe of a uh, decline, about perceived national power and the fact that that is made up of capabilities on the one hand and then also intentions, that is already a good starting point, and we see that 
both of those matter also in cyberspace. So there are capabilities that matter and there are also strategic intentions in cyberspace that states follow. Uh, so I think that there we see already there is an analogy. Uh, and and it, at the same time, it also shows us, by, by thinking about capabilities, for instance, that there are some differences in cyberspace, and probably the most obvious one is the territorial aspect. So the borderless nature of cyber um, allows some states to punch above their weight. Uh, and so that, that is for sure kind of a, an extension or a difference of, uh, of with terms of the traditional thinking. And another interesting ex aspect to me uh, is this duality of cyber power that we also see uh, played out in the capabilities. So we can see that with an increased dominance in cyberspace, uh, there tends to be also an increased vulnerability. Uh, that means if we think like uh, increased connectedness and also increased dependency of the digital uh, economy on, on, critical, on digital critical infrastructure, uh, we see that that comes obviously with, with more threats and a, a greater vulnerability surface. Uh, so, <clears throat> in conclusion, uh, I think that by by kind of sketching uh, this out, we can we might say that traditional national security objectives as well as uh, economic growth that are part of the traditional conceptualizations of power still matter in digital space. Uh, and therefore, we also see that countries are traditionally considered to be great powers. Uh, when you then go through the assessment of the capabilities and intentions that they have in cyberspace, you see that they are also important players in cyberspace. However, uh, we have also countries like Lithuania, uh, which is a smaller country in Europe, uh, close to the Baltic Sea, that is a, a play, an important play in, a, in specific domains uh, of cyber, like uh, because of the geopolitical situation, uh, it had to ramp up its cyber defense capabilities and has uh, established uh, some good skills in cyber security and also established a, a regional center for cyber security expertise. And I think that's, that's Im interesting and shows uh, this, that smaller state also can have some sort of weight. Uh, and with that, I take you the second part of, of my talk by looking at the relationships in digital space. Uh, and this is uh, kind of linked to recent work I've done. Uh, and it comes without saying that the digital space has completely changed the way uh, we connect as human beings, the way we stay connected to our loved ones, but also the way we kind of create our social networks by enabling to, can, to extend the networks beyond boundaries we had before, and also to reach really uh, new people uh, through platforms like uh, that were mentioned, Meta, uh, and, and so on, the, the social media platforms that really have changed the, the ways we interact with each other. However, it also comes with many challenges, uh, and we are aware of those. Uh, um, uh, and I think like this is, well, the challenges, uh, challenges I mentioned now are not a finite list, but some of the challenges that I see that are important in this discussion. So for me, like the challenge of identity and anonymity and linked to it, the challenge of fake identities and deep fakes uh, in this space, uh, has really consequence about the way we see the transparency and trustworthiness of online information on a or and relationships built in the online space. It's obviously the whole question about algorithmic bias uh, and how that also is linked to uh, potentially unequal treatment. Uh, and these also can uh, reinforce distrust among the user and the citizen. There are effects that, are, that we see in online spaces, uh, like well-known effects, uh, like echo chamber effects, that do uh, have the potential to kind of fool polarization uh, and uh, undermine diversity of perspective and also trust in alternative viewpoints. And then there is also limitation on as uh, so we human beings, we rely uh, a lot on nonverbal cues in our uh, interactions 
uh, and the limitation of a lack of verbal cues in many of the online interactions we have. Uh, and I think those are, are some of, of, the, of the major challenges. And you can see that trust really emerges as a key aspect in this discussion. So with that said, I, I want to take you on a small tangent uh, with uh, regard <laughs> to the question of trust uh, and kind of question ourselves uh, which mechanism define trusted relationships. And I want to do so by um, by bringing an example that might, uh, yeah, the, I will explain how kind of it fits into this discussion in a moment, but uh, it's a, a study I'm, I, I just have finished with colleagues of mine at the University of Maryland, where we uh, worked with uh, networks of extremists uh, radicalized in the US. And this specific study was uh, on individuals that expose the Islamist ideology. Uh, and uh, that have, who have been radicalized in the US, as I said. Uh, so it's a, it's a very special network. It's a highly violent network and individuals that are linked to this network that are no, by no means kind of representative of larger faith communities or social groups. But the reason I bring it up here is because when we went into this study, uh, we originally thought the online networks that are <coughs> so prevalent in the discussion on radicalization uh, and extremism that we would see that those o overshadow some of, of the kind of local mechanisms. We know that that can kind of take place in, in violent ne uh, social networks. That is one reason and the second one is because um, this is a network of co-offenders. So co-offending relationships are based and selected on, on, on trust. Uh, and so it's interesting to see kind of what drives this relationship because it's a, it's a, high, it's a covered network that is highly security oriented. So trust is an important dimension in this discussion. Now, um, what, is, what is very interesting to me is that we find uh, that actually local connections uh, and geographical proximity uh, really matter and, and we did a social network analysis of this network. Uh, and so we looked at the structural effects and the individual effects, and I can go uh, in more detail into that in the discussion if you want. But we find uh, that two mechanisms really drive trusted relationships in this network, and that is the mechanism of homophily, so shared characteristics and shared values, and drive connections, and uh, the mechanism of uh, Transitivity and transitivity is also a locally rooted mechanism whereby if A is connected to B and B to C, A is more likely to be connected to C. And we see that this is a very strong mechanism uh, that plays. And all of that kind of feeds into the fact that we think that local connections and face to face interaction uh, really matter for mobilizing extremist activities. And so it's really important to intervene at the very local level and kind of not forget that although the digital dimension is is also important and one doesn't kind of uh, overshadow the other so in conclusion uh, the examination of state power structure within the digital space underscored the profound impact of digital landscape on global power dynamics and we have seen the nations uh, harness cyber capabilities in a strategic fashion to safeguard their specific uh, national interests, such uh, as uh, is in the case of uh, Lithuania that I mentioned briefly. However, we have also seen that the core concept of national power and traditional power dynamics remain uh, important also in the digital space. Secondly, concurrently, human relationships face the challenge to navigate new complexity in the digital space and in the digital era. Uh, so connectivity and social net networks expand alongside challenges like anonymity and misinformation. However, uh, we have also seen that, the, that mutual contacts and local interactions continue to be important for establishing trusted connections. Um, and so with that, I've finished. <laughs>
Thank you both so much. I think in a remarkably short amount of time, you've given us a really rich diversity of perspectives on some of these questions and a lot of material to think about. And I'm going to start with just a couple of questions for our panelists on the basis of what I heard kind of cutting across your presentations, and then we're going to open up to the room. And so one thing I noticed um, in your presentation, Fabio, was you started with or a thread throughout your presentation that ran from beginning to end was the utopian hope for, well, utopian hope is a historical constant almost, but then utopian hope specifically in our moment as applied to cyberspace, almost in the literal sense of a hope for a kind of placelessness that doesn't have some of the limitations of the places we inhabit. And then you, you left us with this phrase that de facto <laughs> the digital space has become an opaque hell of control. Um, and so kind of taking us from that utopia to the very non-utopian reality in which we live. Um, and I think a common thread of your presentations was, if you will, re-embedding us in our thinking about digital space and how deeply it remains rooted in various more traditional forms of power from nation state power structures to the capitalist political economy um, to the forms of relational power that can be cultivated at the local level for good and for ill as you were discussing Anina. And so I get one thing I'm curious to hear both of your thoughts on, I think we're in a moment where the dystopian dimensions of digital space and cyberspace have very much come to the foreground in our public conversation. Do you think there is still a role for imagining uh, digital space in utopian terms? And what could that look like as a constructive project, particularly from the vantage point of democracy? Um, are there things to be recovered from that earlier utopian moment um, that could inform how we try to structure digital space today and bring it into dialogue with the other forms of place we're exploring? Um, or do you think that project has essentially exhausted itself? And Fabio, I want to specifically name your focus on how the Catholic Church has approached cyberspace um, and whether you see any useful material there. Um, and Anina, your more political focus on how nation states have approached cyberspace, but also on how it can be used maybe as a vehicle for building as well as disrupting trust for reinforcing relationships at the local level. Do you see any positive potential in that from a democratic point of view? I'll leave it open to either of you to begin. Oh. Uh, so the, I think that uh, America was an utopia once and then uh, it, it still can be an utopia and we are still working on, uh, on your utopia, which is also the utopia of, uh, of European. So I think, yes, that internet or uh, the, the cyberspace yes, can sti has still the potentiality to be uh, utopic and not dystopic. The only thing is we don't have to think that automatically, because it's a nomadic space or has the possibility to be a nomadic space, uh, will produce uh, positive things. Now there is a moment of disappointment because we are enclosed in those uh, world gardens. But outside of those world gardens, uh, there is a deep internet, there is a possibility of, uh, uh, of finding other, uh, other spaces. The role of regulation and uh, especially the role of uh, democracy in uh, communicating to people how to deal uh, with, uh, uh, with this uh, deep internet would be the future investment for democracy, according to me. Because otherwise we will uh, risk to uh, be walled inside uh, those platforms uh, and extracted automatically having uh, maybe the sensation you can do whatever you want but you are really moving uh, in, in circles around in, uh, in, in a sort of enclosed version. Now the national state uh, uh, is true that they have uh, still uh, a strong role. It's, uh, it's also dramatic, uh, uh, they are also in, in dramatic crisis. I, I, if I, I imagine China trying to wall uh, uh, themselves to, uh, from, uh, for instance, uh, 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 Western platforms, but producing in themselves another platform which uh, uh, they use, TikTok, for instance, but, uh, which means they are, are forced anyway to use uh, the same aesthetic and sociological language that was in, invented outside. So it's a, 
uh, in, in general also this is a crisis of control in a way uh, in which uh, the Chinese government sooner or later will have, uh, will have to deal. No, another, another example was uh, uh, discussed about uh, uh, was uh, uh, a couple of researchers in Rome were analyzing uh, the ISIS uh, uh, films which were uh, uh, diffused uh, at the old time uh, uh, on the internet. They were realizing that they were made uh, with a strong iconophily stranger they were by people they knew how to use uh, editing, music, uh, um, uh, this, this kind of language uh, is, is, uh, is the language uh, is, is, a, is becoming a, com a common language, so you are forced to speak in this language. It doesn't matter what you are saying. Uh, no? The medium is the message <laughs> in, in, in general here. So it's a, uh, it's a problem which uh, everyone has, uh, uh, has to deal. I think that, uh, yes, it's still possible, but democracy uh, will be the investment, uh, the investment on democracy and communication. Uh, uh, it's uh, extremely urgent. I, yeah, I, I agree with all of that has been said. I think, like, I'm, I'm a hopeful person, so <laughs> I, I, I think we should also not give up hope because we want to design system and a society and and use and and the digital space, as I said, is. So key uh, nowadays, it will not go away. So we have to find a ways to use it. And, and I'm just thinking, I kind of we have we have discussed some of the threats of it, and I have pointed to these effects that are well known. But we we start also to learn about the space and about identifying these effects. And once we know those effects, uh, we can also try to counterbalance them, right? So I think like that is also a way to look at it, and I think it's kind of really comes down also to, to really the big questions kind of in which kind of society we want to live it, which kind of system and, and kind of to design a system that meets our utopian ideas <laughs> and hopes, I think. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think on that hopeful note, let me open to the room. I imagine there are some questions. So do we have our mic runner ready? Julia is ready. Yes, who would like to open us? We have a question from Elijah up front. Thank you both for being here. Um, I'm curious what your perspective is on who would be the best mediator, right? You gave this historical kind of overview that the church served this role for a while and now it's kind of shifting to private platforms like Meta and Google, but there's obviously problems with that. And from a trust perspective, what what people who use cyberspace and, and the internet for, for these varied aims, who would they trust more? Is a private company, the state, some sort of intervener like the church or a, a faith group? Is it, um, does it have to be led from people who use the platform? So I'm curious what your position is on, on that. And that's a question for a political scientist probably, <laughs> but I, I would say, I, I, I mean, I, I'm more like that's a personal perspective on the issue, but I don't think we should fully trust uh, companies like Meta and Google, obviously, because uh, I think we should uh, look at this more from a, from a nation state perspective and of, from le regulation and, and the way kind of using those type of mechanisms that are in place, because it's something that concerns us citizens, and so I wouldn't kind of delegate that to any <laughs> private company because we know of the consequences of that. I think that's obvious. So that's kind of my personal stand uh, on it. Uh, and the second one was the trust. Like, was that Which? <laughs> I think, yeah, that goes into what I said before. I don't think, like, I, I, and I think that it's, yeah, people don't trust that private companies take that over, that's for sure, I think. Uh, and I mean, in my opinion, they should not, but maybe you have another point of view. No, in general, I, I wouldn't demonize uh, the private company, of course, uh, but the, mm, it, not even uh, think that the role of state uh, will take uh, uh, the position that the states could have had, uh, I don't know, 
50 years ago. I think uh, the, the state uh, have to, has to transform. We need uh, more agency which, uh, uh, which enter in mediation between uh, the world of, uh, of companies and, uh, uh, and the world of states uh, to, to reproduce uh, uh, the favorable dyna dynamics, uh, for instance, uh, which uh, uh, helped us uh, to overcome uh, uh, the first wave of Manchesterian capitalism, for instance, trade unions uh, and also group, also the church can have, uh, uh, or, or the religions in general, can have, uh, can have a role in building uh, those uh, communities which are in the middle. Because uh, in, in this moment, uh, uh, the, the, um, I think that the, the worst risk for uh, uh, democracy would be the out-out. Uh, you know, everything that's to the state, you transform in a despotism uh, in which everything is controlled by the state. Uh, there are huge investments in, uh, in, in this kind of technologies in, in many states, or either uh, you are in the hands of uh, an algorithm and, and then they decide uh, and extract all the value that can, they can extract from you and then throw you away. Uh, yeah, for uh, uh, talking about the church, uh, was uh, what, what uh, I had no time to say, but probably is not uh, very interesting because I'm not, not a theologist, but I would like to know uh, your opinion, for instance, uh, is uh, that the, the church uh, in this moment has uh, the problem of being uh, really connected to a place uh, when they, for 60 years, they lobbed to have back uh, the papal state, uh, even having uh, now the, uh, the Vatican City. And uh, uh, for sure, uh, the evangelization is uh, very important and now coincide perfectly with the communication. But communication uh, in the contemporary world means also society of spectacle, anyway. Why? The uh, church, uh, the, uh, in general, all the religions have a sacramental part uh, uh, which should, be, uh, should uh, 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 have effect in the territory, in the community of people. You cannot have a Eucharisty online yet. And in the future, <laughs> I don't know, but then uh, if in the future it's like this, we plunge in the, in, in the world of metaphors uh, in the, uh, in the, and the church is not founded out of the... the is not founded on metaphors, it's founded on a place. And maybe like uh, as a follow-up to that, I think it's, it's also useful to think about this question from perspective of resilience and thinking what makes systems and uh, even societal system and political system resilient to, to these disruptions. And I think we know that kind of more de decentralized systems are more resilient and thinking about including diversity and having like the different perspective and different stakeholders, uh, as was mentioned, is really important. So really looking from that angle is helpful as well. A, a thread I hear across both of your answers in a way is the need to create what you might call a digital civil society as a third strategy between looking to the state and looking to the private economy. Um, that was, of course, the, the strategy the Catholic Church pursued in the 19th and 20th century to strike a balance between statism on the one hand and market individualism on the other. What would that look like in the digital realm, I'm left wondering? I see Professor Canstrom had a hand up, so could we go to him, please? Thank you. Very interesting presentation. I wanted to ask a sort of fundamental linguistic question, which I think was implicit in both presentations. It, it always struck me that it was never inevitable that we would all come to refer to this arena as cyberspace. When you talk about the internet, you have a word that is fundamentally a word of communication and dialogue and intellectual energy. And when I think about the role of artificial intelligence as it's emerging now, it strikes me that's, that that is increasingly putting pressure on this metaphor of space. And I wonder if you could just think a little bit with me about what is gained and what is lost by keeping this metaphor of space, or should we be thinking about transcending it more? I realize it's a very abstract <laughs> question. But. No, in, in general, I, I started exactly from, the, from this idea of the fact that automatically we think uh, uh, to an elsewhere like a space in, the, in, the, in modern terms. In, in the ancient times, uh, maybe it was a bit different, but I'm not, but I'm not an expert. But in, in this moment, uh, in this long moment, this last 500 years, we have the tendency of think uh, to, the, to an elsewhere and to otherness uh, placed, placed in a space. Now we have the, the cyberspace because we have computers and internet. Before was a utopia, 
uh, was a real place, the kingdom of Prete Gianni or another place uh, uh, in, in some place. For, uh, for the, uh, the um, enlightenment was China, was, uh, <laughs> was the other place. Those were imaginary, so this is something ah, But China was not imaginary, no. for instance. <laughs> 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 no, in, in the sense, uh, it's, it's, very, it's very difficult because uh, 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 coming out from, sp from space and time, uh, it's, it, it's difficult to think uh, to someone else. Uh, you, th you think uh, to the artificial intelligence like, like a sort of, uh, of news of uh, uh, the mind of God, uh, that primarily uh, enclose, enclose all, all of us uh, without leaving any space. But uh, to create the world, uh, Anyway, also, also the mind of God has to contract a bit uh, to leave space to the mankind. So I think uh, the artificial intelligence sooner or later, uh, even if assume this, uh, uh, this level, this importance, uh, we, we have to deal with, or we will deal it as a, we will put it in a space in a way. They are already talking about oh no, using robot with in, uh, artificial intelligence, for instance. We need to see this thing in, the, in a space or in another space. I don't know how to, I, I don't know the question, I, I don't know the answer, I know just the questions. <laughs> For this reason I teach. <laughs> I still think maybe you have a natural tendency of thinking about spaces because it also brings in the idea of interacting and it, it also, it might be helpful to continue to think in that manner because it allows you to kind of see the different spaces we are increasingly kind of uh, interacting in. So the virtual space, the offline space, the, the different uh, communities that we kind of uh, interact with and, and maybe it's helpful to try, although they are interconnected, to still like see the differences as well and how we move in these different spaces. So I still find the idea kind of helpful in that sense. Uh, to think about it in, in space terms. <laughs> I just wanted to add here, you know, um, Jonathan Wurtzen introduced us this morning to dis the distinction between space and place, which has been fundamental to a lot of the theoretical literature. I'm familiar with some of the literature on the phenomenology of place that reacted against the language and metaphor of space precisely because it was so often rendered as this empty, homogenous container devoid of meaning whereas the language of place allows for particularity, for kind of fundamental and usually embodied meaning. Um, and it does occur to me that cyberspace can be a profound medium for meaning. You know, thinking to Pope Francis, um, you made the point that the sacrament is embodied, um, but you could also make the point that the gospel can be preached and perhaps grace mediated through cyberspace. In that first year of Francis's papacy, when he had a lot of these viral images of works of mercy, um, washing the feet of prisoners on Holy Thursday, which no pope had done before. That exposed millions of people around the world to a lived, embodied expression of the gospel that they had never seen in actual <laughs> physical churches before in many cases. And for many Catholics, I think it revived their faith in the institution um, to see that flood of images of Francis doing the works of mercy on social media. You know? And so I, I wonder what potential there might be with examples like that um, for thinking through some of the dimensions of cyberspace we don't often pay attention to, keeping the metaphor. Who else? Who else might like to add? I'd be, yes, oh, sorry, Jonathan, go ahead. Quick follow up to what you just said. Do you, either of you see place in in whatever we're calling cyber whatever? Because <laughs> we talk about it like okay, it could just be this unmarked thing. But is there something that is an analogous to what we've been talking about in the sense of the physicality uh, uh, of placeness in the physical world? But do you, is there place in the cyber world? Again, we are moving on the, uh, on the plane of metaphors because, for instance, uh, my Facebook account is a place where I go, but it's really in a platform which is not mine. It's not my house, it's not on my desk, uh, and, 
uh, they uh, they use it to extracting value from uh, from me so it's uh, uh, it's not really a place uh, it's more a theoretically a metaphoric space it's also it also can vanish in any moment in any moment uh, the, because there is electricity here now <laughs> i can i can access to but without electricity i can but a large part of the world don't have access to the in terms of virtual reality or like people that are interacting in, in these ways is it I'm not doing that, but I think theoretically it seems conceivable that you do get placeness in these sort of ways that people exist online. I think you get augmented placeness in that sense. I think like the future we're facing goes into that direction, right? And I think it, it will be, it's always a perception, whatever we do say, so it will be a perceived as a place. It's just like not a place that is kind of physical in that sense, but imaginary but once we are in it I think we still perceive it as a place with all what comes with it and, and a place uh, and then it comes down to the definition of place but if it's about kind of interactions and a, uh, a space where we can interact together then that definitely fits. Uh, but you know. the key word is reality which is not a place, not the same thing saying a place, uh, saying virtual reality, augmented reality but what is reality we don't know. Oh, you could ask, you know, for those theoretically invested in the concept of place, how essential is physicality to place um, and embodiment as opposed to some of the other dimensions that tend to be highlighted, such as meaning, community, relationship, um, endurance across time that very much do exist in cyberspace. And I, I think that's one of the larger theoretical questions it poses for, for this conversation. May I ask you? Yes. How important is that the church is a Roman Catholic church? Very important. <laughs> so Rome is important as a, as a place, but it doesn't exist as a place. <laughs> Ab uh, we might want to talk about that one over dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions before? Yes. Thank you, Nicholas. I was just going to add that, that a place, if it means a territory, has to have at least two dimensions and not three. So, you know, the foreign policy practitioner, outer space is definitely a place. You know, it's full of satellites, and Mr. Putin has just deployed his new nuclear device that can, you know, shatter all the communication satellites. So it's a place. But if it's, you know, if it's not, you know, sort of sanicunan for territory, then it's like you said, it can be a home without territory. Would either of you like to respond? Uh, for me, the, the, uh, the existence of place is connected to the, the very idea of uh, genius loss, the, 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 uh, the flavor and the atmosphere which is, uh, which is in the place. But there are, there are places which are not territories, for instance, for sure. I don't know if there are territories which are not place. On the, uh, on the contrary, for sure, what I have in my mind uh, can be a, my own place uh, during uh, the development of the absolute state. Uh, say the only the only place Torquato Accetto was writing in, in, in the 17th century, I think, that the only place where uh, the prince cannot find you, it's your own memory, your own brain. Uh, you are safe inside uh, that place. Uh, but there, I don't think there are territories which are, uh, which are not places. I think it's a philosophical discussion we are entering with it. I Putin is not very philosophical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as a sociologist, I don't inherently link it to territories, uh, but it's, it's more like places of interaction and kind of communities, I would say, but it, it probably comes down to the definition you use. Uh, place. It can be many things. <laughs> and thank you for bringing the concept of territory into the conversation as well. When, when we opened this series in October, um, Professor Charles Mayer of Harvard made the case that we actually need all three of those, place, space, and territory, and some account of how they differ from each other. Um, in order to really map what we're talking about conceptually. So figuring out how territory plays in might be another interesting thing to pursue over the next conversations. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. If you could wait for the mic. 
for the benefit of those watching in cyberspace. Uh, thanks so much for your panel and for your contributions. Um, my question is for Dr. Schwarzenbach, um, and it relates to the issue of trust, which is such a huge issue in, in the modern world and in capitalism. There are these, we rely on trust, the sanctity of contracts and the trust of families and family firms. Um, but what are the trust enhancing mechanisms in, in the cyber world and why do they seem to so easily collapse? And is there any uh, vision for a restoration? I mean, how, how, it might relate to the question about the role of nation states, which you kept coming back to, but is that, is that the solution? Um, who, who polices this domain and why, why do we believe anything um, online? <laughs> I think like, um, yeah, the, as, is, as you rightly pointed out, the question of trust will really dominate the discussion on, on how we kind of design these systems in, in, in the digital space. But uh, that's why we can see this, referring back to, to what I presented, you see this, uh, this idea of shared values and shared experiences that is really fundamental, I think, also, and, and obviously, the authenticity, that th those are all like questions that we will come back again and again. But in terms of mechanism, we see also, uh, and I, I have presented a very special social network, but we see in many, many social networks that this, um, what I said, the mechanism of transitivity, so kind of this uh, uh, indirect connections uh, that you have, that they are also, you kind of trust, trust if you, if you know that somebody else is no, knows this person, you, you kind of instinctively trust this other person, or it even though like it was... We have to trust something outside of the website. The real Maybe, that could be <laughs> one solution. But it's, it's just uh, this local aspect and dynamics that we see, and, and probably we will not go too many steps further to trust, but it will be like in a closer extended network that we have, and so that I think that is for sure an, a mechanism that continues to play out, I can imagine. Do we have time for, all right, we are out of time. Thank you so much for a lively conversation. Let's give our panelists a round of applause. <laughs> and we are now on to the next.